So, my name's James and I work with Drupal. Um, these things always seem like some sort of support group where you go, hi, my name's James. Um, and if you've been working for Drupal with Drupal for any amount of time, sometimes you do need to be around a group of like-minded people going, help me. Anyway, this presentation isn't a help me presentation. This is something that we at Catalyst have worked on with one of our major clients to make Drupal the center of uh, a web of different applications. So, hence why the title's slightly different to what's on the, it's, it's an integration hub, but anyway, I changed the title. Okay, in the beginning, there was Drupal and it was good. Well, it was okay and then suddenly designed <coughs> views and forms and panels and everything else and it got better. You know, it's, Drupal is a framework, it provides content management, libraries, user management, comprehensive API, we all know this sort of stuff. Uh, large 30 pod, third party module set, if you've ever done a contrib module, I thank you. Um, from the bottom of my developer heart, because it means that I haven't had to. However, sometimes Drupal needs to play with others. Most of the time when you launch a Drupal site, it's pretty self-contained. You have all your user management, all your content management, everything else, all in one box. The project that we had to work on, however, had to talk to a number of different services. Uh, Moodle being one of them, and I'll go through the stack, or the hoard as we like to call it. Um, so we had Drupal as a CMS, um, Moodle, which is an open source, who's heard of Moodle before? Okay, so I don't need to explain that. Um, so we had Moodle as our LMS. Uh, we had a proprietary student management system, which was um, developed by another company um, based out of Geelong. We had... Yep, uh, as soon as I figure out how to. Uh, so where's that? Okay, what I might do is just lean over a bit. Is that a bit better? Okay. Um, so, Drupal was a CMS, uh, Moodle was a LMS, we had a student management system developed by a company out in Geelong, uh, two different payment gateways, uh, Salesforce as a CRM, uh, Simple SAML, which is a lie, if anybody's dealt with <laughs> Simple SAML, it is a lie, um, as our identity provider, and Amazon Web Services, and they were all meant to present themselves as this single platform. And the site's been running for a year and a half now, and the users don't know that it, they're different applications. So we've, we've done that pretty well, I think. However, what we decided was that we need a control centre. Um, we, need we needed a spot where, we could, where the functionality was reaching out to all the different things, but on one spot. And Drupal presented as the ideal. I think the volume's come up. Okay. Um, so, we decided on Drupal as being the core of this sort of um, content management system and uh, this integration area because of two major reasons. The comprehensive API meant that we could build out against it and the large third party module set meant that we didn't have to build everything. Um, we could extend on it but we didn't actually have to start out from scratch on everything. Whereas if we had, to say, if we decided on Moodle as being that point, there would have been a lot more work in turning that into an integration hub. Also, these things. Um, you know what, I'm going to turn this off, I think. Just bear with me for a minute. Yeah. Is that better? Or has I turned off everything? Okay, we'll try that. Um, so... Web services. Now, WebChick talked about web services this morning in Drupal 8. By the sounds of it, they're going to be doing web services on steroids. Um, everything will become a JSON object, which is a joy to hear. Um, hooks. The hook system allows us to build multiple different parts of, say, the user save area. And trust me, that'll come up. You, the user save and enrollment was a massive process we had to build and using user save hooks and those hooks around that area allowed us to build it in, in parts without having to build monolithic sections. Uh, believe it or not, PHP is actually mature. Um, and as we see, it's actually moving towards a much more object-oriented sort of design with the later versions. Um, as somebody has recently told me, it's been dragged kicking and screaming, but it is being dragged. And Drush. Who doesn't love Drush? I mean, I personally live on the command line as a developer. 
Um, and being able to do things in Drush means that I don't have to use the interface. The interface is great if you're an admin. Um, how many people are admins? Okay, first off, how many people are developers? Okay, how many people are admins? Okay. So for all the developers here who know, who know and love Drush, thank you. Um, but it is great in term, because not only can we use it when we're developing, but we can use it when we're deploying. Um, our deploy process actually use, utilizes Drush to do feature updates, feature averts, and all that sort of stuff in an automatic manner. And it works. Um, when I first met features, wasn't such a fan, but now I am. Also, the fact that Drupal is a framework, it means that developing new features is a lot easier than if it was a straight CMS. It's designed to be extendable. It's designed to be built on. It's not designed as a, um, here you go, oh, by the way, we can charge you you know, several hundred dollars an hour just to build this extra bit because it's going to take months to do so. All right. So when we decided that Drupal was going to be the core, there was a reason for that. Our entire setup is a, as a learning system. It's a learning platform. A user comes to Drupal, enrolls in a course, and then gets taken to Moodle. That sounds very simple. Except, uh, well, as far as the user is concerned, that is all that happens. User comes in, <coughs> picks the course they want to go to, fills out the e-commerce stuff, you know, credit card, all the rest of it, succeeds, in, you know, and then it gets taken to their Moodle class and they can start learning. In the background, however, there's a number of different services being utilised. So this real-time com story is pretty much what happens when a user is created. Now, this is just creating a user, not enrolling. So we have a creating a user, new user registered with Drupal. That is stock standard Drupal registration. Okay, we've created a Drupal user. However, Drupal then using real-time web services talks to Moodle, says I need to create this user. Right, good, let's synchronize the IDs. So the ID in Moodle and Drupal now matches. Then they go to the student management system and say, hey, here's the Drupal idea of this user. I need you to create him or her, sorry. So they create the user and then they send back some information about that user. So that's with the identifiers. Then they go to talk to Salesforce and say, okay, here's a new user. You need to create a lead for this user so you can track them, um, sales stuff around them. Then they send back an ID, an identifier about that user. So in this user creation, you're actually talking, just the creation, you're talking to three different services to actually complete a user creation system. Now this is all real time using web services. We actually have this reversed as well. There is a way that in Salesforce, they can go in, click register user, and they can create, and it basically sends the information to Drupal. Drupal via web service. Drupal then says, okay, now I need to create the user in this, in this student's, blah, create the user in this student management center and create the user in Moodle, and then set, manage that information. And that's all done via real-time web services. Now we have another type of um, integration, which is queuing. Now, um, queuing is also known as batch processing, um, asynchronous, any other name you can call it. But basically, there's a delay. There's an expected delay. It's not expected to happen now. So if we go back to here, if one of these systems is not available, especially the student management system, we have a problem. Because it's real time, we need that information to complete an enrolment. And if we can't, don't have that information, we can't enroll. With this one, which is queuing for an invoice, um, this is after the e-commerce process has happened and after the enrolment. So user decides to enrol, goes through our e-commerce process, user registration has happened, payment gateway says, yes, I got their money, now you can give them what they want. We need to give them an invoice. So student management system, which does the enrolling part of the system, which talks to Moodle and says, enrol them in this user, then has to put a, puts a message on a queue which in this case is an AWS SQS queue, which is just a packet of information about the enrolments and all the rest of it. Drupal via Cron, which basically just schedules every 12, 15, however long you want to do it, says, okay, is there a message on that queue? If there is, I'll pull it down, process the information, and then generate an email with the invoice attached and shoot it off. So this is not happening instantly. This happens every five minutes. So the, invoice, the, the time sending off an invoice is not as essential as actually getting them into the classroom. 
I mean, it is essential, but it doesn't have to happen in real time. So we've seen two different examples, and it comes down to there's a number of questions about which one you'd actually pick when deciding whether you're going to whether you're going to use a real time service or a queued service. So I mean, the, the key one here is, can you wear a delay? Do you need this happening in real time? In our example of the user enrollment, that has to happen in real time. The user expectation is that we need to go, OK, I'm filling out my details, I've filled out my credit card details, have all my monies, I want the classroom now. So that happens. That's why we do it in a real time system. The invoice, on the other hand, can come in five minutes. That's not something that needs to happen right now. It also comes down to how much information you're trying to process at a time. If you're trying to do large chunks of work, like say um, thousands of messages are hitting your system all at once in a real-time system, can, would it be easier and would it be better to actually batch them so that the, you can actually tell the system to say, okay, instead of taking off this chunk of work all at once, try and do it in bite-sized chunks. That's where the queuing and batching system really comes into its own because it means that Instead of loading your system up and ma causing massive spikes, you're actually processing things in a sort of regular pattern and a regular way. That's sort of, which leads on to the resources question. Um, so, how many people use AWS or other cloud service? Okay, what happens when you load spikes? Okay, um, your bills go up for a start. Um, you're having to force, you're having to run up new instances to to actually support everything. But you want to avoid those sort of load spikes. So you either spec it out so that you, um, so you take into account load spikes, so that say you get enough CPU to deal with a load spike, but that's on an ongoing basis. Or you can, if you're dealing with real time, or if you queue it, you can bring it down lower because you're only dealing with it in bite-sized chunks which can be processed in that sort of smaller RAM CPU load. Now, the other thing is, how will, this, how will the service affect your application's operation? In the example I gave you of the real-time comm story, if the student management system goes down, we're, we're a bit stuck because we can't enrol the user. Okay, there is, because it's real-time, because it happen, has to happen now, we have a problem. So um, basically, we need to account for that. In when you're looking at how you're designing your service, if you're looking at your system and it's real time because it has to be there, it just means extra work in making sure that that service is always available. It becomes 99.9n .9 to the power of infinity rather than five nines. Because as soon as one part goes down that's essential, you're a bit boned. Which leads on to tolerance failure. Um, the other thing you have to worry about is what data governance requirements you have. Now, the project that we, work, that we worked on is a, um, an education project. It has certain government requirements when it comes to actually storing data, what sort of data you store, <coughs> how, it's, how it's stored, and all the rest of it. So we need to take that into account when it's processing this information. Also, it comes down to, a, it comes down to taste. I mean, through all that, it can come down to what you're comfortable with. Are you more comfortable with dealing with real-time services? Are you more comfortable dealing with queues? It's, I mean, as developers, we all have a preference for, some, for one or the other. I mean, we've all seen the flame wars on stack, on, well, basically any technical side. Personally, I have a, I, I have a leaning towards queues because it, it, it's much more tolerant of failure because if you stack up, instead of, um, the message is dying if a service dies. You've got a stack of them that can be processed later on. So you can pick up again. So um, web, web service versus queued death maps. This is basically just a list of um, areas where the, they, it's basically pros and cons. Sorry, I haven't had my second coffee. I'm not, I need three. Um, okay, so web services real time, part of the page build in Drupal. So they are, with the web services, you're bootstrapping Drupal a lot. If you're hitting it every time, you're, if you're doing it real time, you're hitting the page, you need to load up a lot of Drupal functionality, and it's being done all the time. If you're doing it in queues, that means you're doing it when you want it to happen. So you can account for that. 
Um, so the queues are the queues are lightweight. The queues are, the messages are all stored off elsewhere. All you need is a curl request to go and get it and pull it down. Um, see, the queues are more highly available than web services. Uh, I was a bit hesitant about putting that one in because queues are like every other service. There is a potential for them to go down. The thing about queues is the data will still be there when they come back up. Um, whereas a web service goes down, you've just got packets hitting a wall and dropping. Um, so web services, however, are incredibly widely supported. So you know, as we say, Drupal already supports web services out of the box in Drupal 7. Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, Drupal supports web services out of the box. You can build your own web services. There's a format to doing that. Um, there are multiple protocols. We've got SOAP, we've got REST, we've got any number of XML formats. Um, so they have weight, they have status already. They've already been developed. Whereas queues are not so much. I mean, you have to build to support a queue. If you want to, so we had to build a curl fun uh, basically a library of curl calls to say, okay, pull the packet down from SQS, yada, yada, yada. Um, web services are not particularly failure tolerant. I think I've gone over that enough. <laughs> um, but they also are a potential attack vector. Because you're dealing with um, data which is being injected straight into your system without knowing, without knowing where it's coming from, well, you can validate. But it's a much easier, it's much easier to use a web service to attack than a queue. If the queue is, particularly, if the queue is something that you've set up, with an expected format, with that you're the only applications accessing it are the ones that you've said can access it. It's a lot easier. Um, web services are a bit fiddly to test. Um, how many people have tried PHP unit testing web services? Yeah. How many people haven't? Okay. Because it's a pain in the butt. Um, We've sort of got around that by cheating, and I'll explain a bit later on about how we've done that. Um, but with queues, you can test all to, the hearts, to your heart's content, because all you do is you say, here's the packet format that you're expecting. Here's the response that you're expecting. If the, what happens if the response is this? And do that. OK, one of the things that we discovered is once we had this integration hub set up, we thought, OK, now we need a way to determine all our the health of all our services. We can heartbeat all of them individually, you know, which is basically go out, set up a whole bunch of Nagios checks, which individually tags each one and goes through and says, are you up? Are you alive? Can I connect? Um, we, we could do that. But we decided that we've already got this integration hub set up. We've already got this bit that says, I can now talk to these services, so why not take advantage of that? So we built a Drupal module, which I'm not sh I don't think has been released. It needs, some, it needs a whole lot of cleanup. Um, but what it does is it actually creates a series of functions which output JSON. So, and also creates a nice pretty page. So at a glance, we can go and say, oh, the student management system is down. We need to find out why. Or um, Salesforce is reporting that it can't connect for some reason. Or even Drupal's talking to Moodle and Moodle's saying um, the user IDs are out of sync. We need to fix that. You know, these are all and we've added all these tests as we've gone along. Um, so we built this module, we integrated it, and now all we have Nagios is hitting, this, hitting <coughs> these web services, these JSON elements, and saying, okay, based on the contents of this JSON, this service is up, this service is down, this variable is wrong. We can alert to that. So we can now do um, Nagios checks which say um, this um, cron is taking too long to run on a particular system. So cron's died for some reason. And a Drup and, or Drupal cron or Moodle cron or something like that. Stuff which is a lot harder to actually do unless you manually go in, write your Nagios check and so on. So that's one example of taking advantage of this, all this sort of web service stuff that we do. Okay, now, some lessons learnt. I'm going too fast, aren't I? Right, we're pos as I said before, I prefer batching. I prefer queue systems because, um, as I said, if, the real, if one part of the process system goes down, 
then everything goes down. I mean, you can, you can account for that, but at the end of the day, if, you're, if one of your systems is down, you're losing data. With a queue, the data's still there, and you can pick it up and process it again. Um, batch processing allows you to schedule how you process requests, which allows you to manage your resources, which means that instead of saying, holy crap nuts, we've got, you know, spike loads of 100% on all our instances because we've got 1,000 messages coming in at once, we can say, okay, we have a queue of 1,000 messages, let's process them at 10 at a time. You know, we can schedule at once a minute to go through to schedule instead of actually trying to do it all at once. Debugging is easier. Debugging a web service means that you're trying to set up a, um, essentially a mock web service setup where you do the call and you're coding a fake endpoint which returns an expected result. Whereas when you're doing queues, you can say, okay, here's the expected packet. Here's the packet that you want and just test against that. Document all the things. Um, I know this is something that everybody says with every project, but when you're running systems which are multiple elements, as, as I said, we've got an LMS, a CMS, a student management system, um, two payment gateways with two different payment gateways and all the rest of it, they need, how they interact needs to be documented. Especially when you, because we built a lot of this stuff from scratch in terms of the protocols that they use, the packets, packet structures that they use, they all need to be documented properly. Because otherwise somebody's going to come along in six months and say, what's going on, and break something because they don't quite understand how it all works together. Uh, don't use XML. I have a personal hatred of XML. I'm sure some of you also do. JSON is pretty. Um, JSON is a lot easier to read and it's a lot easier to process. Um, so, that, again, that comes down to a personal preference. You may like XML, in which case I apologise. Uh, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> um, unit testing your services. Now, this is one thing that we did um, at the start of this project. We decided that when we were going to unit test, we were going to unit test using PHP unit tests. Now, this in Drupal is in Drupal 7 is not supported officially. Um, but we had a look at simple test and it really wasn't doing what we needed it to do. So, in terms of, so we went through, so WebChick went through unit testing this morning on Drupal 8. A lot of that we've actually ported backwards. So we've got a lot of the interfaces, we've got mocks, we've got classes, the whole setup is now set up in, in this project and they are run automatically via a continuous integration service and they work, they work very well. Um, they've also allowed us to do things like setting up proper web service testing because we can mock up an interface which says, yes, hit, I'm pretending to be a web service endpoint that you can call data from. Um, make sure that you've got a graceful failover. If you're going to web service it, make sure that there's a way that it's not going to bring everything down. That's one of the lessons that we really learnt um, early on was that we needed to make a way that, okay, sometimes services aren't there. You know, it's the nature of the beast. Sometimes the service that you're relying on, for whatever reason, will not be available. You need to be able to say, okay, it's not there. I'm sorry we can't do that at the moment. Instead of saying, oh, and blasting everything to the screen and the user sees it. So you need to be able to say, so in the case of, say, Salesforce becomes unavailable for whatever reason. What we do is we say, okay, yes, we've enrolled your user, but we need to, um, in the back end, so the user, the user's fine. The user goes through, does an enrollment, goes to their classroom. But in the back end, what we do is we actually make a note and send a message saying, okay, we've created this user, but you're going to need to manually create the lead in Salesforce for them. So that way they get everything synced up again. So it's graceful failover, test your definitions are correct. I mean, this is all basic stuff. And that's it, I've gone through very quickly. Oh, you apologize. <laughs> anyway, that's Catalyst. Uh, we're New Zealand based, Sydney based, Melbourne based, do all the open source things. There's the clients. And there's some of the techs we use. So. <coughs> Have you got any questions? Yep. Um, I was wondering, if, did you consider using something like an enterprise service bus, like MuleSoft or something like that, to do the integration rather than do the integration in Drupal itself? 
No, the, the project that we worked on was actually basically a second iteration of an earlier project. So there was a lot of stuff that we were getting for free for this because the work had already been done in terms, especially the Drupal Moodle side. That was already working, so we took that and said, okay, now how do we extend it to work with everything else? Um, so yeah, the Drupal Moodle side was, is all web service based. We don't do anything like drop into each other's database to do anything like that. We do everything via web servers. So yeah, basically it was, got this working, let's see what else we can do with it. Yep. How did you go with logout of all these different systems using simple SAML PHP? So simple SAML PHP, basically when you log out, you log out of Drupal and Moodle. So the student doesn't see the student management system, the student doesn't see Salesforce or anything like that. Any changes that are made to their profiles, addresses, or that sort of stuff, gets communicated via web service to the other systems. Because otherwise, you... Yep? Um, you were talk, talking a lot about queues. I was just curious whether, for example, what you do, do you use any sort of external queuing system? Like yep, so... We what use... So, the pro so we use AWS SQS queues for our queuing system. The main reason being that um, AWS is a hell of a lot more scalable than using the internal system. So our internal system is um, all database based, which carries its own load problems. Um, and if we can farm that off to AWS and say, yeah, you deal with it. I mean, we can have thousands upon thousands of messages on a queue and it's a blip. It really is. I'd, I'd actually recommend it. I mean, it does come with a caveat that it's an external service. At some point, they may not be available. But Amazon's pretty good at keeping up time until it's not. <laughs> yep. Um, so what sort of modules were you using with it for that? Was it um, in general? Was it the services module, um, web service clients? Or so we built a lot of... I mean, we, we relied on um, Drupal's underlying web services sort of core, but we built, built a lot of it ourselves. Um, we, for the e-commerce stuff, we use that a lot. We use Drupal Commerce with coupons and all the rest of it. In terms of the web services, yeah, we built a lot of that ourselves, especially the queue processing stuff, because basically that is essentially a series of curl calls um, that we just say, OK, here's your SQS key, here's the process, you know, go out, get the message, come back, process it. So, I mean, where we used a lot of the co contrib modules is more in the content management side of things. Um, in fact, content management is another example of where we're using web services as well. I should have put that up there. The course information is actually stored in the student management system. So all the information goes in there, all the modules, all the units, and they press a button and via web services they export that down into Drupal. So all that information gets pushed into Drupal, that automatically set up in Drupal saying, OK, here's the new content, here's start end dates for the courses and all the rest of it. Moodle, sorry. Okay. Moodle also t talks to Drupal about course information. About this bit. It pulls more of the um, content management side of the course information across. So we have a student dashboard which says, OK, here's your new me next module, yada, yada, yada. And that information gets pulled across from Drupal via web services. Um, yeah, that was actually the question I was going to ask, because every time you interact with a service in real time, yeah. pulling information from it throughout the day, yeah. you also have that option to, um, you know, say it's uh, a difficult API to interact with or whatever, or um, it's not on the right kind of hardware for you to be able to hit it all day like that. Yeah. And you also have that option to export all of that data from, from that source yeah. into, say, a SQL database on that same remote server and be interacting with that instead by remote calls or to be moving all of that over and have it sit on, on your hardware. Yeah, as look. A, even in the Drupal table. And, well, that's, so that's what we do with the course information. Is basically, so they do their bit in student management, then they push it out. Okay, and then we have a, you know, basically it blats the database saying, here's the course information, replace the old stuff, here's the new stuff. We keep uh, track of all the old stuff, so it creates a new version or a new, a new copy of the course information, and we have all the old stuff in there, so for, again, the auditing purposes, so there's, you know, government requirements around what we store. As an architect, it's really hard because you're interacting with the client early in the relationship, and you don't know yet which one of those you're going to recommend. Whether exactly. Whether to interact with their service or their export, the whole thing. And it's really big decisions. They're sort of 50-50 decisions, mm. aren't they? They are, and it, it comes down to, again, it, so I was being a bit flippant when I said it came down to 
developer preference, but in many ways that's an, ac that's an accurate description because as I said, I prefer queues. I would much rather be able to work out a system that did the enrollments using queues rather than um, real time. Because we've had situations where, for whatever reason, one of the parts has fallen down. You know, whether there's been a routing issue or a problem at their end, and we've had to deal with that. And that is bad for the, bad for the business, it's bad for the user. But if we can support, basically have a seamless failover which says, OK, we've created this, we'll enrol you in a few minutes because we're just having a little bit of trouble, and, but the user knows that they're going to be enrolled, rather than, please come back in a couple of minutes and try again, Yep. Um, when it does fail in terms of web servers, do you then chuck that like into like another SQS queue to say that when it does come back up, you know, fix it up? And we do with the, we do with the Salesforce stuff. So we do with the Salesforce stuff. The student management system is a bit more complicated. So because there's that whole enrollment stuff as well, um, and so Salesforce is sort of considered a secondary thing. Yes, we can go back afterwards and rebuild their their lead. The student management system has to be there, has to be working, sort of an integral part. It's the, the three core parts are Moodle, because they've got to learn, Drupal, because they've got to pay, and student management, because that's where all the other information lives. That's where all the government auditing information lives. That's where all the course information lives. Well, we rely on things like Drupal Watchdog and stuff like that. Um, we can do things like error, mes you know, error messaging to the admins, emails. That, that tells you, but what do you do with user requests? If, if the... Local or is that no, we don't, do local, we don't do local queuing. We just say, please come back later in a little while. Yep. Is, is user management also replicated to Drupal? User management starts in Drupal. So that's where the user enrolls, that's where the user registers. Um, Drupal is basically, so we have a couple of different um, strong sources of user information. Drupal is where the user puts all their information. Because the user logs in, user fills out their address information, then that gets replicated out to the other areas. But we can push back from Salesforce, say if they call up on a, on a call center and say I need to change my details, they go okay, push, click, da 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 da, click, pushes back into Drupal and pushes back into the student management system. So Drupal is the master of the student management system? Sort of. In, ter in terms of basic user details, yes. But there's a bunch of stuff called a VETMIS, which is government required information around this sort of stuff. That comes actually from a form in Moodle that gets pushed straight to the student, in, um, and that's where that lives, is in the student management system. But in terms of authentication? In authentication is Drupal. Yep, they log in via Drupal. That's it. Yep. Uh, your preference for uh, JSON over XML, is that because of performance or is it, is it parsing? Or um, I find JSON easy to work with. It's, yes, I think it's, it's easier and quicker to work with a JSON packet than an XML packet. It's not as heavy to process. Um, personally, I like looking at JSON better than XML. Um, it's just easier for me to read, and and it's easier to define. So you can, and so yeah, it's just easier to use in XML, especially when you're dealing with okay, are we using REST? Are we using SOAP? Are we using a, a new definition, a new XML definition that we're setting up for this packet? Whereas with JSON, we can just say okay, da 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 da. Here you go. Oops, sorry. Just write out a new packet structure, and away you go. You don't need to build a validator for it. You don't need to do anything like that. You can just say, does it match? Yes. Um, well, no, okay, so we cache the front end a lot um, because we get a lot of people using the system. Um, but once you're logged in, not so much with the caching because a lot of the interactions are real-time interactions. So if they go to the course, they need to be able to see their, their answers, their stuff. They don't generally live in Drupal land once they've logged in. Once they've logged in, they're off to Moodle. Yeah. The thing that needs to process in the queuing service goes down. Yeah. If the, okay, if the queue is lost, as in the queue gets deleted or purged, then we have a problem. Okay, um, we do need to set up redundancy in our queues. 
Um, the idea being that if somebody goes in and purges the queue, they're going to get fired very quickly. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, so basically sometimes, you know, crap happens and things go away. And, and we, need to back, we need to work out how to do that. It's, it's an ongoing process of what we're doing. So there was a... Yes and no. <laughs> so we built this site. Uh, this site's been running for over a year and a well, almost a year and a half now. And there are lessons that we've learned about how. I mean, we've made changes since the site was launched. Um, we put more stuff into queues. We put more logging into queues as well. Um, we have multiple instances running, so logging mean and we we might even put watchdog into queues, so that we can pull that off and process that in other ways rather than having to go through and try and do a Drush Watchdog show or whatever. Um, still have, uh, while I said I would like to find a way to make enrolment and, and user registration queue-based, I still haven't found a way that would make it, give you, give you the same experience of user enrolls, user gets classroom. So, still investigation. But it's, a learning, it's always a learning process and we are constantly moving on with, you know, okay, that's not quite working, let's try it this way. And we, iterative improvements. So, yep. Um, so you've got updates to users that can originate from different places where yep. they're going through the queuing system. Um, you presume you don't have a guarantee of which order those things are going to get processed in. No, they're pulled off straight, first off the queue. So, you if they get clashes between them, you have to resolve that you've got things have been upgraded from two sources, and now you're processing them out of order. And we, are there clashes where one thing can be? Well, one of the things that we learned was don't do into, don't do, um, so basically, when we started, you could do um, student information, update student information from all three sources PEPI, um, sal the Salesforce, student management system, and Drupal. We decided that's probably not a good idea, so we removed the student management system as a way of actually pushing out student information. Because the, the student management system should only be getting student information from either Salesforce or Drupal. Okay. So basically, <clears throat> if Drupal pushes information, it goes to both. If Salesforce pushes information, it goes to both. But so the student management system doesn't actually push anything. It, otherwise, yes, we'd have to have some way of actually doing it. To, which is the canonical source of good? Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. How do you define good or concurrent users? Yeah, um, look, we, we've run two different projects based off the sort of Drupal Moodle project that we, we originally built. The first one handles a lot of concurrent users. It's a, one of the, it's a free um, MOOC sort of setup. Um, and it handles a lot of users. We've got something like 500,000 registered users with maybe 1,000 or 2,000 concurrent users at, a site at any one time. <coughs> and it handles that load quite well. I mean, we have spikes, especially when we do rollovers for enrolment, when people, everybody goes to the class at once. You know, when you get 30,000 users, you go, yeah, yeah, I can learn. You've got to be able to support that. <laughs> but, you know, it sort of p patterns out. And because we do... Um, uh, the way we work is we have an instance with Moodle and Drupal on it. And it, when we spike, we add new instances. And using the load balancer, it all works quite well. Yep. Uh, at least, to ask you, do you actually use AWS as well for the Drupal instance? Yep. We use um, Opsworks and AWS for the Drupal instance. And it is a Drupal Moodle on the same server sort of setup. So when, it's, when Drupal and Moodle are talking to each other, they're not talking to each other via um, the URLs. They're talking to each other via local host. So it's, that way the communication happens without any possible interruption. Yep? Just on the uh, reporting side of things, I mean, you, you've got Salesforce, but that could go away at any moment. Yeah. No, most of the reports come out of the student management system, and that's because they're actually set up to handle all the government requirements. So, again, when I mentioned a vet miss, that's all the government required information. So when you do a TAFE course or some sort of um, 
technical course, there's a questionnaire you fill out which is, contains a bunch of information. I, you know, do you speak English at home? Are you of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander heritage? That sort of information. That all is required information by the government so that they can better target their information, their services. And that's all handled by the student management system. Any more questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, no, sorry, we've got to... That's what we use Simple SAML for. So Simple SAML gives you a session outside of the Drupal Moodle se session setup, um, and they all and they all pull from. Okay, so this is sort of less of the web services and more in the user stuff. But basically, what we do is we use Memcache to store our session information, and that what we have a single Memcache instance which handles all that information. So basically we go through, we say, okay, this is your session ID. It goes, okay, check with Memcache. Yep, that's valid, regardless of what instance you hit. So Drupal itself on the server isn't doing session information. It's just asking Memcache if that's a valid session. Um, to be honest, we didn't have time. <laughs> it was one of those, um, okay, we're going to do this. Oh, look, we're going to do it now. Um, but yeah, we could po quite possibly port it. It's, at the moment, our module is essentially a series of curl calls. But we could quite easily, well, when he says quite easily, he says, you know, with difficulty. Um, we, could, we could port that to part of the core API as well. Um, if, if there isn't already an SQS one that somebody's popped up in the last year and a half. I'll have a look, but yeah, but we we had this particular setup that we needed to do, so. Any other questions or remarks, comments? All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>